Before we get started, I, you know, I want you to tell you this, this little account about my daughter, Chelsea, and I, and I do this to sort of set up uh, what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, when Chelsea uh, went to college, she went to college in New York, in the Bronx. So she lived in the Bronx, and uh, she still lives in New York City today, lives in downtown Manhattan. Not a place I want to live, but uh, that's where she loves, so more power to her. Uh, after a visit home from college, it was my turn to take her back to her apartment. She lived off campus. She lived in the Bronx. She lived in a little apartment. So I put her back in the back of my 98 old Dodge Dakota extended cab, and I put Taylor in the back seat, and Chelsea rode shotgun. Now, you have to know this. This is a little teeny pickup. There's not a lot of room in there. It's not very comfortable. We got about a three-hour ride, and we're leaving really early in the morning because we want to get up, get... Chelsea set up in our apartment, and then we want to be home by 3 o'clock. On the way up, everything goes, goes really well. You know, our intention is, is get her up there, come back. And we get up there in the allotted amount of time. We get Chelsea set up in her apartment. Intention is to leave early, and we're going to be back in Delaware by 3 o'clock. Now, like I said, the ride up goes perfect. There, there's no problem. We get there on time. We're headed back in the direction of destination Delaware, and... That's our intention. So we're headed back and everything's good. And I start to think, you know, we're making pretty good time here. Everything is going great. Now, I've only been to, uh, up to New York a couple times at this point to see my daughter Chelsea and to take her back or do whatever we had to do up there. One time we went on vacation to just spend some time with her. But, you know, I've not been up there enough time to know all the landmarks. Now we're headed home, I'm about an hour and a half into the trip, and I'm thinking, you know, things just don't feel right, they don't look right. So I start going over in my mind uh, exactly what uh, the directions were. Well, I can't find any mistakes, I don't know the landmarks, so, you know, I think I'm headed in the right direction. That is, until I see this sign. Pennsylvania <laughs> welcomes you. Now, I know where I intended to be. But instead of being in Delaware, I'm in another state altogether. I'm in Pennsylvania. See, no matter how good my intentions were, the direction that I was driving in took me to Pennsylvania, not to Delaware. My intentions were great, but the direction I was going in was wrong, so I ended up in the wrong place. And that's because it's direction, not intention, which determines destination. Direction, not intention, determines destination. And we all know this to be true, now don't we? If we, we know the direction we head in is the direction that we're gonna go in. And sometimes it's like that story I just told you, it's a little bit inconvenient. We ended up a, about 100 plus miles from where we wanna be, and it's a longer story. We never got home until midnight that night. But, uh, you know, so we wanted to be home at three, we get home at eight hours later. Uh, sometimes it's just a little inconvenient. But sometimes these things happen in our lives, right? I mean, how many of us wake up one day and we just find ourselves in a place that we never intended to be in? The direction we took in life took us to a destination that we don't necessarily want to be in. You know, I don't think any of us want to be broke at retirement. But the things we do and the things we've done the direction of our spending habits, the directions of our saving habits, led us to being broke. We didn't intend to be out of shape and in poor health as we get older, but our eating habits and our lack of exercise have led us to a place we didn't intend to be in. We didn't intend to become an alcoholic or a drug addict, but what started out as a little bit of fun led us to a place we never intended to be in. And the list just goes on and on and on because direction not intention leads us to a destination. But here's the good news. Because you know it's not gospel unless it's good news. The good news is it's never too late to change direction. It's never too late to go and end up at the destination that you want to be at. See, I didn't get home at the time I wanted to get home, but I got home because I changed direction and started heading towards the destination I wanted to be in. If I didn't change direction, I'd still be driving today. I would have never made it on. <laughs> so this is what I'm hoping to be able to show you this morning through the scriptures. First of all, first of all, no matter 
where you're at in life right now, it's never too late to change directions because God always keeps his promises. He promises. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And that plan is not to harm you, but that plan is to give you hope in a future. Number two, God wants us to have voluntary involvement. He could make us go where he wants us to go, but he loves us way too much to do that. He loves us so much that he gives us free will to determine our own direction. And third, God will provide whatever we need to help us change directions and reach the destination he has and he desires for each one of us. And finally, I want to give you a warning. Even if your intentions are good, if you go in the wrong direction, you will take people you love with you. you know, just like I took Taylor to Destination Pennsylvania instead of Destination Delaware, because I headed in the wrong direction, we ended up in Pennsylvania, not where we wanted to go, in Delaware. My wrong direction took her with me. So what I want to do this morning is I want to give you this principle. I want to give you this truth, and it's important. This truth runs all throughout the scriptures. It runs all throughout God's word, and that is direction, not intention, determines destination. Who we are and what we become is in part not because of some past generation's intentions or even our intentions, but because of our past generations and our own direction. And who the next generation become, who your children, who your grandchildren may become, won't be because of our intentions, but because of our direction. We can have really great intentions, but if the direction of our life is wrong, it doesn't matter how good our intentions are, because it's direction, not intention, that determines destination. Now, the portion of Scripture we're going to be looking at this morning may not be particularly well known to a lot of you. We're going to be reading from the book of Ezra. We're going to be reading from the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And Ezra is sort of tucked between 2 Chronicles and the book of Nehemiah. It's in the, what we call the Old Testament. And Chronicles is a bigger book. So sometimes when you're looking for a small book, find the bigger book, find Chronicles, and then go backwards until you find Ezra. And if you get to Nehemiah, you've gone too far. Now, uh, if you have a Bible, I ask you to please follow along with me. And, and I want you to know it's okay to take notes in your Bible to help you remember and to encourage you later. You're allowed to write in your Bibles, but if you don't have a Bible or you like the Bible that I'm speaking from today, which is called the New Living Translation, please, we encourage you, we invite you to take one. They're right by the door. Grab one on your way out. Bring it back with you next week. We just like the privilege of handing out God's Word because many books will inform you, but that book will transform you. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, just follow along with the words on the screen this morning. Take notes on the back of your bulletins, and then next week you'll have your own Bible. And as you find the book of Ezra, what I want to do is give you a little bit of history of what's going on at this time. What Ezra does, it introduces us to the last hundred years of recorded history in the Old Testament. Now that's not a hundred years before John the Baptist comes on the scene. It's not a hundred years before uh, Jesus is born. But it's a hundred years, uh, it introduces us to the last hundred years of recorded history. See, there was 400 years between the last chapter of the Old Testament, which is Malachi, and the first chapter of the New Testament, which is Matthew, where God was completely silent. It's what we call the silent years. And for this 400 period of time, God remained totally silent. There were no silent. There was no prophets. There were no vision. There were no dreams. There were no words at all from God. So therefore, there's no recorded biblical history from God at that time. So the book of Ezra actually introduces us to the last hundred years of recorded history in the Old Testament, which is about 500 years from the time Jesus would be born. This is a period of time that, that most theologians and, and most uh, historians call the Great Reformation period or the Great Restoration period. Now, what God has been doing all through the scriptures up to this point in time, he's been giving his people an account of the history from the very beginning of time itself 
very beginning of creation itself. He's been revealing his nature. He's been telling of the coming of a Savior, a Messiah. He's been speaking through historical accounts. He's been speaking through his prophets for over 3,500 years. And now he's coming to the climax of his story. God's beginning to wrap up all the story, and then he's going to go silent for 400 years. Now you got to try to imagine this in your mind. I try to picture this in your imagination. If you were God, and I speak as a fool, but if you were God, and you would come to the main point of everything that you had talked about for the last 3,500 years, this is the climax of everything he's told us, how would you wrap things up? I mean, would you wrap it up by reminding the people how sinful they are and how much they needed somebody like God? Would you, would you show them what happens when you don't obey Him and, and how wrathful you can be and how you need to sort of walk the line? Would you remind us of His power? See, God's given us His story. But He doesn't do any of those things. We might think that, that in our mind, as we get to the story, that, that the hero is all powerful. And if you don't obey what he says, if you don't walk the line, he's going to come down. But that's not what God does. He's shown us creation. He's shown the fall of mankind to Adam and Eve. He's shown us how Israel, his chosen people, had let him down again and again and again. And he's shown us, for the most part, that we are just stiff-necked people. We are prideful. We're disobedient. We're in need of a long-suffering, merciful God. Time and time again, he's had to chastise, he's had to judge, he's had to send his people into captivity, into bondage. God's shown us over and over again that left to our own devices, we're just plain simple people and we deserve judgment. The prophet Daniel stated in his prayers, Lord forgive us not because we deserve to be forgiven, not because we're worthy, but because you're a merciful God, because you're a God who keeps his promises. So this is how God comes to the climax. And this is how he begins to tell us his true nature. God wraps up all of recorded history, not by showing us his wrath, not by showing us his power, not by showing us the law, but he tells us a story of restoration. God shows us his great love for us by stating, I don't care what you've done. I don't care how hard your hearts have been. I don't care how much you've disobeyed me. I don't care how much you've ignored my laws. I will stir your hearts once more. I will provide everything you need. I will restore you once again. And he gives us an invitation, an invitation that's open to everyone. Now, I don't normally do this, but for some reason I feel led to do this this morning. And uh, I'm going to ask you once again, I promise this will be the last time uh, before we leave, unless there's a fire or something. <laughs> will you stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's Word? I'm going to be reading Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and I'll be reading in the New Living Translation. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put his proclamation in writing and to send, his, and to send it throughout the kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem. Expenses by giving them silver and gold, supplies for their journey and livestock, as well as a voluntary offer for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Reading of God's word for God's people. Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, Lord, we just ask that your word will speak to those of us that are here this morning. And Lord, if there's somebody in here that, that life maybe hasn't taken them in the direction that they thought they would be in, and they're in need of restoring, they have gone in ways that weren't, to your will that today, Lord, that they will see this loving God who offers this invitation 
to come back to him, to a God of restoration. Father, we ask that you speak through me, Lord, and that as we leave here today, uh, people don't say what a great message, but they say what a great God we have. We ask this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You all can be seated. So anyway, here, here's the setting. Uh, uh, Seventy years ago, Babylon has been uh, has overtaken uh, Jerusalem. Now, now Babylon, the word Babylon means confusion. We get it from the Tower of Babylon. If you if you know the scriptures, you may remember that. Jerusalem actually means the city of peace. So here, here God, I mean, I, I just, I love God's word, and sometimes uh, studying God's word, when I go back to the original root, I see uh, not only God's sovereignty, but I see God's sense of humor, all right? Because here's the city of peace, who's not doing what God wants them to do, so confusion takes them over, and they become captive in confusion. Now, how many of us have had peace, sort of walked outside of God's will, and all of a sudden we're in a place of confusion. So God has this wonderful sense of humor if you really start reading his word. And I just love it. So God does exactly what God says he will do. The, the, the Medo-Persian Empire comes in and overtakes the Babylon after 70 years, just as God had predicted in the book of Jeremiah. Now, sometimes we wonder, you know, why are we so surprised when God does what God says he's going to do? But some of us act like we're in shock when he does that. And this, this part is amazing to me. So here's Daniel. All right? Daniel's sitting around. He's reading what we now know as the book of Isaiah. And he comes to, to what we now know as chapter 45, verse 13. He, he's sitting down. You know, I can see him by the fire. Now, what you have to know is Isaiah was written about 200 years before this period of time. And here's Daniel reading this ancient manuscript, probably sitting by a fire or candlelight. And, and Daniel's reading, and this is what Daniel reads in God's Word. He says, I will raise up Cyrus to fulfill my righteous purpose. I will guide his actions. He will restore my city and free my captive people without seeking a reward. I, the Lord, the heaven's army, of the heaven's armies have spoken. Now think about this. 200 years before Cyrus is even born, God has his prophet Isaiah speak his name and record his name and write it down in his word. So Daniel reads this, and he runs to King Cyrus, and, and he shows him the prophecy. You, you can almost see Daniel's face as he lights up. He's sitting there, and he goes, oh, I can't believe this. this. This is a king I'm at right now. It's been 70 years. Look, 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 Cyrus, right here in Scripture. God's talking about you. Your name is written in his word. God knew you before your parents knew you. God's about to bring his people out of confusion and back into the land of peace, out of Babylon and back into Jerusalem. God's about to restore his people. Now let me ask you something. Does anybody in here besides me needs a little bit of restoration in their life? Oh, yeah. I mean, would you like God to restore our nation? Would you like God to restore our families? Would you like God to restore your health, to restore your finances? To, to take you out of the bondage of alcohol and drugs and nicotine, to restore your worship, take you out of the land of confusion and restore us to the land of peace? I mean, this is, this is a part sometimes when I have a hard time with because, because I've heard this message preached in, in two different ways. I mean, I can, I can preach it like some of the TV preachers preach it. Just, just do a health and wealth and, and, and self and, and, and name it and claim it. But the problem with preaching that is that's not how God usually works. Yeah, and there's no doubt that he can do it that way. I'm sure we all know, know some stories of miraculous hearing, healings and miracle, miracles in finances and miracles in relationships. But most of the time, God lets us choose to be restored. That's right. God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us, but he is a good God, and because he is a good God, he gives us the free will to answer his invitation of grace. He lets us choose 
the direction of our lives, and remember, direction, not intention, determines destination. And honestly, preaching truth is not always popular. People don't want to hear that they have to change. They don't want to hear that they have to be part of it. They just want to hear what makes them feel good. But, but I don't waste your time, and I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to look back a year from now and see everybody in exactly the same spot they are right now. And that's because direction, not intention, determines destination. But here's the thing, it's not only true in our lives, it's true in the next generations. What the next generation becomes won't be because of our intentions, but because of our direction. We can have great intentions, but if the direction of our life is wrong, it doesn't matter how good our intentions are, because it's direction, not intention, that determines destination. Benjamin Franklin is credited with saying the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I mean, if you do the same things you're doing right now, you're probably going to get the same results that you're getting right now. If you keep on going in the wrong direction, it's just going to take you farther and farther from where you want to be. Most people have good intentions. And, and, and we can have good attention about little things and big things. I mean, I got a friend of mine. He goes in the right direction in almost every area of his life. He considers himself to be one of the one percenters. I mean, he, he, him and his wife probably make about a half a million dollars a year between the both of them. They, they live in a great big house. They have their health. They exercise on a regular basis. He tells me he's still running 30 to 40 miles a week. Uh, I don't even drive 30, 40 miles a week. <laughs> so he's successful in every area of his life. And when I ask him about him and God, he says, me and God are okay. I know he doesn't intend to perish in hell. And I'm not his judge. Ma Matthew 7, 1 says, judge not that you be not judged. But based on God's word and based on the fruit in his life, unless he changes direction... Hell is exactly where he's going to end up. That's not his intention. But direction, not intention, determines destination. And I think sometimes we need to look at our own life and our own lifestyle. We have to ask ourselves, am I headed towards this place of eternal bliss with God? Or in my lifestyle and what I'm doing, I don't intend to end up in hell, but does my lifestyle and the things I'm doing going to lead me there? You know, let me give you a simple illustration. If I, if I want to take my family to Disneyland on vacation, I mean, I have great intentions. I call and I make the reservations. We get all packed. And, and I'm telling my kids uh, uh, they're going to meet, you know, uh, uh, Pluto and Mickey and Minnie. And, and they've written them letters. And, and I mean, we are just so excited. And we get in the car. And we get on Route 50 and we head east. We're ending up in Ocean City. We have great intentions, but Route 58 is Ocean City, not Man you know, Anaheim, California. Direction, not intention, determines destination. So here's the first point I want to make. God is a God who keeps his promises. We see proof of that in verse 1. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the first year of Cyrus's reign over Babylon was 538 B.C., the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had given through Jeremiah. God had promised after 70 years he'd destroy Babylon, he'd take his people out of captivity, out of bondage, and that he would restore his people. And that's exactly what he did. So let me ask you this one. Hey, is there a promise? that God has made you? Has he told you that your husband or your wife will find salvation? Has he told you your health will be restored? Has he told you that your finances will be restored? Has he told you that your family will be restored? God is a God who keeps his promises. God knows what you do not know. God can and will restore you, but he does not say it will be easy. See, that's the way most of our, we want the easy way. Verse 3 shows us his imitation is an imitation of grace that we can't earn it, we can't buy it. It's just simply an invitation of his loving grace. An invitation that's open to everybody, to everyone. See, there were several million Israelites living in Babylon at this time. And King Cyrus says, any of those of you, any one of you, 
Anybody who wants to go, any of you who are Jewish, God's people, can go to Jerusalem, to Judah, to rebuild the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel. But out of the many, many millions that were there, the people who lived in captivity, only about 50,000 of them took them up on the offer. Only about 50,000 of them took the invitation. See, just like my, my, my friend, sometimes people get really, really comfortable in Babylon, don't they? They get comfortable where they're at. God's willing to restore us, but we just never take God up on his offer of restoration. Point one is, God keeps his promises, and point two is, God desires and wants our voluntary involvement. In order to have restoration, we have to take an action. He gives us this invitation of grace, but we have the free will to either accept it or decline God's invitation. We have free will to take action or not take action. We have free will to go in the wrong direction or go in the right direction. It's up to us. We get to choose where we end up. See, in the difficult times, in the difficult times is when we learn what we're made of. It's in the difficult times we find out who we really are, and more importantly, to find out who we are, we find out who we want to be. Yeah. See, this isn't the time to give up. This is a time to take action. This isn't the time to sink in. This is a time for restoration. And it doesn't matter if you haven't rested. It doesn't matter that you're tired. It doesn't matter you're in bondage. It doesn't matter that you're in captivity. God desires and wants and promises you restoration. He offers you and He offers me a way out. But the fact is, most of us have good intentions. We don't start out wanting to be addicted to alcohol and drugs or to nicotine. We intended to have a happy family, but somewhere down the line, our choices led us to where we are today. Amen. See, I intended to provide my family with financial security. I intended to, to retire early. I, I intended to have a lot of money in the bank, but you know, man, that's a nice big screen TV. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a really nice car over there. You know, if my family only had that great big house, you know, I, I know I don't have as many kids as my mom and dad had, I, but I do need a house six times bigger than theirs was to live. You know, besides, I work hard. I deserve it. You know, I had no idea that the economy was going to change. You know, I intended to live healthy. But doggone it, them Big Macs just taste so good. <laughs> you know, I don't have time to work out. You know, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken care of better myself. But, you know, it's just too late now. See, God wants to restore us, but we have to take action. He offers it, but we have to do it. We have to change directions at times because direction, not intention, determines our destination. And each one of us, each one of us has experienced a need at one time or another for restoration. And we know in the back of our minds God keeps his promises. We know God invites us to be restored, that he allows us to choose our own direction. And sometimes even though our intentions are good, we end up at a bad destination because we went in a bad direction. We know he offers us this. But it's not easy. It's just easier to stay where we're at. So the first point is God is a God who keeps his promises. The second point is God wants us to have voluntary involvement, but we have free will to choose our own direction. And the third point is this. It's found in verse 4. God will provide everything we need to be restored. Wherever this Jewish remnant is found, let their neighbors contribute toward their expenses by giving them silver and gold. Supplies for the journey and livestock, as well as a voluntary offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. See, God is a God who keeps his promises. God is a God who desires our voluntary involvement. And God is a God who provides everything we need to be restored. You want your family restored? Genesis 18. Abraham will surely come to be a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. 
for I have chosen him, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised. See, if Abraham didn't do what was right and just, God had no promise to keep his end of the bargain. Direct your children, your household, to keep the ways of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Is it easy? No, it, it's not easy. But it's the right direction. <coughs> you want your marriage restored? For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Husbands, love your wives as Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Is that easy? No. It's just the right direction. You want your finances restored? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room for it. He who gathers little by little makes it grow. Whoever loves, loves money never has enough money. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Is it easy? Of course not. But it's right here in God's Word. Give, save, live on rest. No matter how good your intentions are, if you're not following these rules, you're headed in the wrong direction. You're going east when you need to be headed west. Direction, not intention, determines destination. You want your health restored? Now, I know there's a providence of God, and I also know there are some people, in fact, there's many people, who've been stricken with a disease or an ailment due to no fault of their own. They were born with it, or generation curse, whatever you want to call it. But I believe even in those people, if they're obedient to God, God will be able to fulfill His purpose through them. I have a, a great friend of mine who I visit because she's homebound in more pain than most people can even imagine. And instead of whining and complaining, she witnesses and brings more people to the knowledge of Christ than 99.9% .9 of all church people. She brings more people to Christ through an unhealthy body than she ever could do a healthy body. But that's not the case for most of us. Most of us, we act like we're surprised when we end up at the doctor's office or worse, at the emergency room. My dad acted like he was surprised when he got lung cancer. He smoked five packs of cigarettes. He was the only one surprised. We had a heart attack. And we're surprised when we end up in the emergency room we've been eating nothing but Big Macs for the last 10 years. <laughs> For physical training is some value. If you find honey, eat just enough. Too much of it and you'll vomit. Exercise and eat in moderation. Is it easy? Nope. Uh. I'm just saying, Satan has to have something to do with food because if it's good, it's probably bad for you, and if it's bad, it's probably good for you. But again, it's direction, not intent, and which determines destination. You need to be restored. God's promise to give us back what we've allowed Satan to take back from us. God's promise he can and will restore us. He's given us a promise, a free invitation by grace alone, and he's provided all we need. Fact is, all of us at some point in time have gone in the wrong direction. But here's the good news of the gospel. You can change direction, and when you do, you'll change your destination. If you're in the wrong place, if you're not where you want it to be, if you're headed to a place you don't like, if you can breathe, if you have a pause, it's not too late. It becomes too difficult. No challenge will be too great. No dream will be too high. When we keep our eyes on Jesus, we find the strength to keep going, to keep trying, to make it all the way through restoration hand in hand with Jesus himself. But God allows us to choose our direction. He loves us way too much to force us to do something. So he risks the fact that we're often going to choose the wrong direction. 
And no matter what your intention is, the direction you choose will determine your destination and will influence the destination of generations to come. Now, we don't like to hear that. And see, God gives us examples all along in the Scripture. Cain chose one direction, Abel chose another. Abraham chose one direction, Lot chose another. David's destination was different than Saul's. Peter's destination was different than Judah's. See, God allows us to choose. It's up to us. So which is it be? The narrow gate or the wide gate? Are you going to build your house on the solid rock or are you going to build it on the shifting sand? Will you serve God or will you serve money? Will you be numbered with the sheep or will you be numbered with the goats? It is your choice. Let God do what He does, but God lets you decide. So make sure you make the right choice. Not the easiest choice, but the right choice. Because it's direction, not intention, that leads to a destination. But as I said earlier, I wanted to leave you with a warning. If you won't change directions for yourself, change directions for the people you love. Amen. Yes. Israelites were held in captivity at this point in time because their ancestors, the former generation, had gone in the wrong direction. I mean, keep in mind, this is 70 years later, so most of the people who had sinned against God and caused God to judge them and punish them by sending them into captivity had most likely died. This generation was now paying the sins for the last generation. Your direction can determine the destination of future generations. Years ago, and I, and I, and I was refreshed of it this week, I, I heard a sermon series uh, and the sermon series was called Future Family. And the very last message in the series was called The Echo Effect. And the idea uh, of the message was this, at least in part, who we are and what we become is because of our parents and our previous generation. And your parents and your grandparents are what they become in part because of what their parents and their grandparents and their previous generation had taught them. In other words, there's an echo effect. And chances are, each one of us will have an influence on future generations. Your children and your grandchildren will be influenced by what you say and what you do and the decisions that you make. You know, we're who we are because of generations that came before us. And whether we think about it or not, and whether we're intentional about it or not, we're part of shaping the next generation by what we say and what we do. Amen. So in other words, the direction we decide to go into is going to shape the destination of some of those who come after us. You know, most of us have stories about our parents or our grandparents that's helped shape us, good or bad, into what we once were or what we are today. <coughs> But we don't always think about, in fact, we seldom think about the fact that someday we're going to be somebody else's previous generation. Someday in the future, somebody will be talking about us as a parent or a grandparent and the memories they have of us and how we shape them into what they are. Now that doesn't mean we have to become what our past generations were. My dad came from a very, very, very poor, dysfunctional family with drug abuse and alcohol abuse. And I use that to help shape me to become what I am today because I never wanted to be what they were. But it was my choice. I could just let it be a generational curse or I could be the person who changed the curse. But either way, they had an, infect, uh, they had an effect on what I am today. What direction? are you taking in your life in the lives of the people you love? I mean, is there something in your life that you need to have restored? Well, there's good news for you. No matter where you're at, no matter where you are right now, no matter what direction you've been going on, if you can blow smoke on a mirror, in other words, if you're still breathing, you can end up and change your directions and end up at a new destination. Amen. Amen. Will it be easy? Probably not. But will it be worth it? Yes. Absolutely. Because the 
direction, not intention, determines destination. And our God is a God who keeps his promises, but he desires our voluntary involvement. He gives us free will to determine the direction that we go into. That's why he gives it to us. He loves us enough to let us to decide the direction we go into, which means he loves us enough to let us decide where our ultimate destination will be. And the good news of the gospel is God will give us everything we need to end up in the place he desires us to be. A life where the captives have been set free. A life of great abundance. So this morning, if you're not headed to where you want to be, maybe this is a good time to come to the altar and talk to God about changing directions. You know, I don't end the service without giving you an opportunity to come to God. So we always try to open these altars up before we close. Is there any part of your life that you would like it to be restored? Will you come to the direction of Jesus Christ this morning? Does your marriage need restored? Does your health need restored? Does your finances need restored? Is there an addiction problem, a, a family problem, a relation problem? And where you thought you'd be at this point in your life? isn't where you find yourself this morning. Simply give it to God and let Him restore you. Let Him do what you cannot do on your own because God will keep His promises. But I have to tell you, He gives you the free will to go in whatever direction you want to go in. He desires it. He gives you this invitation of grace and you have the ability to accept it or deny it. The scripture reminds us when we repent, when we change direction, God will give us everything we need to end up in the place he wants us to be in, which is always better than the place we think we want to be in. Direction, not intention, determines destination. What direction are you going in this morning? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we... we, we <laughs> We speak this. These things are so much easier to stand up here and say than to walk out of here and live. Amen. Lord, I just ask you to stir our heart. We can't even be restored until we know we need to be restored. I didn't even know I was lost until I found out I was lost. I was headed in the wrong direction and didn't even know it. Lord, when you revealed it to me, I had a choice. I could keep going in the wrong direction or I could turn around and go in the right direction. People are in your house this morning, Lord, and they are in need of restoration. Their intentions are good. My intentions are good. But I went down the wrong path at times. We went in the wrong direction. So we thank you, Lord, for giving us another invitation of grace. Thank you for providing all that we need. Thank you for leading us in the right direction. Restore to us, Lord, everything the devil's taken from us. Restore our families. Restore our health. Restore our finances. Restore our nation. Lord, restore our worship. Lord, let this year be a year of restoration. Let this year be the year that we are restored. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, next week's going to be a great week to invite unchurched friends as the walking miracle comes and, and ministers to us in music. And we would welcome you. We would encourage you to, to bring an unchurched friend. We don't want to take people out of other churches. We don't want to transfer King God's kingdom. We want to build God's kingdom. Amen. Amen. So bring somebody. It's not going to be real church. It's easy to invite somebody to concert. Not so easy sometimes to invite somebody to church. There's going to be great singing. So make a friend, bring a friend. Who knows? Maybe God will move in a powerful way and bring a, God, a friend to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us this morning. May the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be among you and within you wherever you find yourself this week. God bless you and thank you.